probably talk about um, shifts in cognitive core concepts in perceptual <laughs> environmental <laughs> cognitive maps or something like that under uh, neurophysiological <laughs> stress conditions. I don't know. I can make up these fancy titles. It doesn't. It's all the same stuff. I mean, what difference does it make? I mean, I can say all of this without ever talking about God. Then I can go to the Benedictine monastery and talk only about God and never about science. And you're always saying the same thing because you're always teaching your being and your being always comes out. Whatever metaphor you use, it always comes out the same way. And what they've got to hear is that that something has happened that really is something has happened. <laughs> and they can only hear that if they stop sending messages of their model of how it all is which means they have got to have despaired of their own model. And very few people who go to national meetings have despaired of their own model. <laughs> Almost by definition. <laughs> so it is not fertile ground to do one's work in. It was like uh, giving a lecture at Harvard or uh, Brandeis or uh, MIT or something. Who wants to know, man? Everybody's got, they've all got their points on their sleeves. They're all winning, you know, rational minds paying off. So I'll go to Washington and a dozen people say to me, we must get together and I'll say to them, why? <laughs> and they'll feel insulted. Why? Why do we have to get together? To reassure each other we're all, we're all all right? For external stimulation? I'll sit by myself, man. I need to sit with you. I don't need to sit with anybody. Why sit with anybody? The only reason to hang out with anybody is to either learn or teach. That's the only reason for words. The rest of the time, sing holy song. I mean, that's what I, I like. I was with Bhagwan Das, my guru brother in India, and, and all these people around the temple, and that's all that ever happened. Either the speaking, which was mostly writing on chalk slates, the speaking was either specifically for the purpose of teaching some specific information about methodology of altering consciousness. Or else we sat silently. If I say to you, it's a nice day, and you say, yes, is that necessary? Why, what is that about? Did I have to reassure you it was a nice day or what? Like. It's like driving with somebody along a beautiful coast and they keep saying, look at that beautiful tree. I feel like I've been through six billion years of hanging out. Let's hang out. We don't even say let's hang out. Just, what are you doing tonight? Nothing. Well, come on over. Well, what do we do? Well, it doesn't matter. We'll just hang out. Smoke some pot. Just hang out. Sure. Okay. Listen to some records. Talk. <coughs> you going to have supper? Well, I'll eat with you. Why? Don't bother, I eat alone. You eat alone? <laughs> I'm driving to Boston. Do you want some company? No. You don't want some company? Wouldn't you be happier having somebody in the car with you? No. <laughs> Well, I don't understand that. <laughs> Certainly unnatural. <laughs> don't you think we should be together so we can reinforce our attitudes so we can make sure it's always all right? I 
I'm interested as I watch around this residential community of, of satsang, the amount of hanging out that still goes on. The, the fierce hangout place is always the library, I notice. There's a lot of hanging out there. It's really like walking into an old movie every time I walk in the door. <laughs> People are hanging out and telling about their interesting events in their lives to each other. You can't let it, it doesn't happen if you keep pulling yourself back down all the time. That's the problem. You don't let it happen because you're too frightened. The ego holds too tight. The ego holds too tight. Keep pulling yourself back down. Every time, every time you start to get into another state of consciousness, many of you experience that with pranayama or breathing or with meditation. Do you ever meditate and you just, you've been doing this rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling, and suddenly, <laughs> You know, it starts to happen. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I was perfectly happy to just be doing rising and falling, and suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a, a tendency, I know, you see, what things I can do with my own body and mind to take me into higher states of consciousness. I also know that there is still some discontinuous stuff in me so that when I get into certain states of consciousness, I will be less effective than in other states. Knowing that, I then create conditions around me that demand efficiency that don't allow me to get into those higher states of consciousness. See the game? So I could always say, if I didn't have that commitment, then I'd really, really let go. So then I can damn that out there, when of course I created that in the first place. When I was traveling with uh, David in Afghanistan and I said to him, David, man, you really bring me down. His answer was, baby, that's your problem. Which was true because he was telling me I am only talking about myself. I created that in him, which is bringing me down in the first place. Time last year when I was alone up in that cabin for days and I would be surrounded with the pictures of Ramana Maharshi, Ramakrishna, Christ, Buddha, Maharaji, Haridas Baba, Bhagwan Das, Hanuman. And I had all their writings around me and the letters and I had my tambora and I was just reading all their words as if they were talking to me and looking at their pictures and singing love songs to them and I was hanging out. I mean, I figured, look, I apparently still need to hang out, but if I'm going to hang out with somebody, I might as well hang out with somebody who knows how it is. There's no sense in hanging out with somebody who doesn't know how it is. People come up and say, what are you, some kind of an idol worshiper? What are all those pictures doing on your walls? I mean, do you really believe in all that stuff? I say, well, you got to cover the walls with something. You know, just pictures. <laughs> and then I say, well, those are the people I hang out with. I hang out with. You can't say to Ramana Maharshi, it's a beautiful day out today. You can say it to him, but man, it, it rings. There's a certain empty ring in it when you do it. It's raining. I wish the sun would come out. <laughs> Imagine that one. 
Gee, my arthritis is killing me, Maharaji. <laughs> he just laughs himself sick. <laughs> With compassion. <laughs> Compassionately. See, once you get intimately involved through consciousness enough with a higher being through the writings of or the thinking or the meditating with, then everything you do all day, you run through that mind. It's just like most young people run everything they do through their mother's mind or their father's mind. And they may do something 20 years later that is an achievement and they can't figure out why they did it, but they know their parent would say, well, that's a good boy that did that. And they get a feeling of pride, some little warm feeling from re rehearsing that thing of running their whole behavior through the consciousness of one of their parents. So if you're going to run it through somebody's mind, you might as well run it through the mind of a realized person who understands the illusion. See, Mary Jackson, the gal that works for my father, she has only one book, and that's the Bible. That's it. And every night she goes up to her room and she reads the Bible. And in the morning, she wakes up early in the morning. I see her light on around four in the morning, and I know she's reading the Bible. And she just runs everything in life through the Bible. And when she's doing the housework, she's singing songs to Jesus. <coughs> now, it's interesting about Mary because Mary can do all that and then turn around and get terribly paranoid about being exploited and get into a tremendous servant master type melodrama, you know and not have any awareness about the Bible at that moment. It's like big compartments. There's Mary 1 and Mary 2. And if you say, Mary, how would Jesus look at that? <laughs> You're feeling that you are not getting enough time off. <laughs> you just feel like you've dealt a dirty blow. <laughs> Because what she'll have to say is, oh, you're right, you're right, Mr. Richards, you're just absolutely right, you're just absolutely right. Jesus would say, just give it all away. Jesus would say that. Yes, he would. It would make no difference. All it would mean is at that moment she had a twinge of discomfort, but then a few minutes later she'd go right back into that same place again. Because there are things in Mary that resonate with the worldliness that are in the people around her. See, you've got to dig. Let's say you work for somebody and money is passed from hand to hand for the work. Now the question is, where is the consciousness of the people who are giving the money and receiving the money? If I am looking, if I am the giver of the money and I am looking at you as help, it is subject-object relation. And if you climb into that place in my head, you and I are going to be stuck in a very low place of paranoia. On the other hand, if both you and I see here is supply, here is demand, here is goods, here is services, here is green energy, you have this, you need this, we'll exchange this, and here we are, and we're doing it from this place where we both see how it all is and we both share the understanding, and we're collaborators. We're collaborators in the role relation, the roles we're playing. If you want to be the boss, I'll be the... You know, we're collaborators. Then the action itself, the work, the labor, takes one into a higher state of consciousness rather than a lower state of consciousness. It's like a woman came to see me the other day who was a teacher, and she said, how can I be a better teacher? And I said, by realizing that you are a human being first and a teacher second. Make a, get into a collaborative relation with the kids, and then you can play the role of teacher and student.
employer employee husband wife lovers father son and as the bhagavad gita says even enemies can you dig having an enemy and at the same moment both of you up leveling so that you see you are both being enemies and that's the way it all is and this is the drama we're caught in and we just got to go through this one and one of us is going to kill the other one that's like the samurai That is doing one's, doing what one does and at the same time not being attached or identified to the role of being the doer. That's what that's all about. Guy says, gee, after I've experienced all this, can I go back to school and just be a, a, you know, a student or be a professor? Boy, if you've got your center, you'll be 10 times better as a student than you ever were before. You'll be 10 times better as a professor. Because if I make a contact with you, if I am teaching you and I make a contact with you where here we are, you are then open to receiving whatever it is since there's only one of us. It's just like I, my right hand isn't paranoid about my left. Watch out for that left hand. It's got a very, very, you know, I don't know. The twist of that little finger looks like I, you know, might be with a CIA. Watch out. No paranoia among us. It's only paranoia about them or him. It's breaking down the compartments. It's just like trying to help Mary to break down her compartments. I can't do anything. All I can do is be something so that every time she's around me, Wherever she was at that moment, she's got to come to this other place because this is the place that resonates with that place in her which reads the Bible. And she does the same thing for me. We turn each other on. I mean, she comes in in the morning. I come down in the morning. I've told you this before. I come in in the morning dressed like this and I'm sort of just coming out of my dreams and I'm uptight. And I walk in and I'm sort of thinking like, uh, oh man, they dumped the garbage out there and oh. Everything's wrong, and Dad's up. I, uh, and I walk in. She said, "Mr. Richard, you look just like Jesus." Wow, baby, that's a hard one to face first thing in the morning. You know? I better get on with it. <laughs> Sin not, lest you. <laughs> and some, I used to say, "Mary, lay off, will you, please? Come on now, it's pretty heavy." Or you sit down, to, I, I have my meal with my family, and she said, oh, it's such a joy to serve the Lord. <laughs> 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 Who can eat? <laughs> <laughs> Who can eat? <laughs> oh, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. See, we all have the problem of Sunday religion. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a thing where we buy off a certain place by a certain kind of purity, and then we have these compartments where then we close off and with somebody else. It's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde phenomenon. It's the fact that we all get to a place where we are two beings. There is a process, a transformation going, and there are two beings. And your focus is like, uh, uh, I once was taking a course in um, histology. And I did the final exam, which was to go look at a slide and write what you saw. And I wrote the whole thing. And all I had done was I had focused wrong and I had focused on the cover glass rather than on the stuff. And I had done a great description of the cover glass, <laughs> which I flunked. Of course. <laughs> well, they gave me a D instead of an F because I did the cover glass so well. <laughs> I mean, it's such fine tuning. How can you be expected to? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of being a conscious Christian is really interesting. The suggestion Spensky makes a Christian. It's 
very hard to think of the holy wars and at the same time be a conscious Christian. Now the question of how fast you can let it all happen, once you have sensed or touched or tasted of a possibility of, I guess, what you could call the spirit or another state of consciousness or another frequency of reception or... <clears throat> See, at first you don't know any better. And so all kinds of different information is coming in and you don't know which information is which. And then you are surrounded by a whole system, a culture, an environment, parents who are socializing agents, they're called in science, teachers, newspapers, news media, they all tell you how it all is. So that when you draw a horse that has five legs on it, somebody says, no, dear, <laughs> here, try this fresh sheet of paper, see if you can do better. Now look carefully. <laughs> Maybe you saw a horse with five legs. So then pretty soon you have learned so efficiently how it all is. The program is in so well that you can't, you cannot not see it that way. You cannot see it differently. You're not able to break your set, it's called. You have a set to see it that way. It's like in the Second World War when the, uh, when the troops were going to Japan on the ships, they would show films of Japanese committing atrocities in order to fire up the servicemen to want to kill the Japanese. So then a guy would go and he would kill the Japanese. Now the question is, if he really bought into that model and then he had to, he killed in support of that model, therefore strengthening that model, how does he handle when the war is over and suddenly now the Japanese are our allies? How quickly is a human being able to make that adaptation to entertain a model other than the model that he started with? Why, when is a person able to be flexible and when aren't they as to possibility? It's like uh, somebody goes out and comes back and says, uh, you know, the world isn't flat like everybody thought. The maps are all wrong. You recently read any of the biographies or the history of the major breakthroughs of Pasteur, what they did to Pasteur, of Freud, of any of those people? When the anthropocentric view of the universe was changed to the heliocentric view, Every major change, every major breakthrough always was rejected, of course. The automobile, airplane, it'll never fly. Come on, you know it'll never fly. Silly Wright brothers. Those kids in that field, they're going to kill themselves, that stupid thing.
It's important that you wash your hands and use sterile gloves before operating. Well, now that's silly. I've been operating for years and no germs have come from me. But you can't see them. Well, if I can't see them, I'll tell you. I'm just not interested in them. How many is a minion? How many is enough? How many is enough for it to happen? How many is enough for it to happen? If you see a flying saucer and you say, there's a flying saucer, everybody says, you're nuts. Two of us see a flying saucer, are we still nuts? Well, if one of them happens to be a lieutenant in the Air Force, well, we'll give him a leave of absence, rest cure. <laughs> He's not exactly nuts, but see? while if you happen to be a, uh, a fringy, you're nuts. I mean, I, if I saw anything strange in the society, nobody would ever believe it. <laughs> Be no chance at all. My credibility rating in this society is very low. It has to be. Took too many drugs. Can't trust what he sees. But let's say I experience something and it's so valid and it's so real to me that even when you say to me, you're wrong and you really didn't see it, you can't convince me because I feel I saw it. Very few of the people who saw flying saucers were able to be convinced that they didn't see flying saucers. Very hard thing to do to convince somebody they didn't see it. Just swamp gas. Didn't look like swamp gas to me. <laughs> the head of the Air Force said it is swamp gas. <laughs> well, then I guess I must have seen it wrong. It must be swamp gas. Nobody said that. Most of them said, well, I don't care what the head of the Air Force said. It was a flying saucer. You know? Some of them even said, and they came down and talked to me. <laughs> well, now, come now. <laughs> and they were this high, and they had, you know, well, how far you go? <laughs> Where did we lose you? <laughs> Where did we lose you along the way? See, when I, when I was uh, socialized to learn how it was all supposed to be in the world, that horses had four legs and that this is the way it is, I learned that this is the way it is because I was told by somebody else this is the way it is. And out of the, all the possibilities of how it could be, I bought into that and accepted that on the basis of that person told me this is the way it is. And that's a trustworthy person because it's a mother and it's big and it knows and it feeds me and it loves me and it must know because it's all wise and all knowing and all loving.
And then the mother becomes the school and the school becomes the university and the university become the books. And it's all the mother. It's all telling me how it is. And I'm learning how it all is and I'm doing how I'm supposed to do in view of the fact of how it all is. And it's like trying to do something where the, the ends don't quite always come, they don't keep coming together quite right and you keep making believe they come together. They, of course they come together because that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> doesn't quite make it, but there's nothing to do about it because that's the way it all is. Now come a series of experiences and as a result of a series of experiences, there is the feeling it's not that way, it's this way. It's a little different than I was told it was. And I see it's this way directly. Not because I'm told, but I see it. I feel it, I sense it, I intuit it. I don't just see it with my eyes, I intuit it. I intuit this is the way it is. It's not that way at all. And then everybody says to me, you're wrong. Now they can't say, see, this is the funny thing. They can't say you're wrong, you didn't intuit it. I say, I just experienced, I just experienced that Buddha was standing right here. And they say, you're wrong. Now, at what level can they say you're wrong? They can't say you're wrong. You didn't experience that Buddha standing right here. All they can say is you're wrong. Buddha wasn't standing right here, which means I didn't see Buddha. See? <clears throat> now, at this point, You've had one experience, I've had another experience. There's all we know. There's, I see Buddha and you don't see Buddha. Here we are, two guys, we have two experiences. So we call in a third guy and we say, say, is Buddha standing there? And the guy says, no. Now we have science. <laughs> That's what science is. Science is a group of guys who agree Buddha isn't there. Well, I don't mean to say it quite as, or they agree that something is there or whatever it is, they agree. It's an agreement. It's consensus. It's consensus by everybody who was taught by my mother. <laughs> That's really what it is. It boils down to. <laughs> it's a closed system. It's like the emperor's new clothes. All the followers of the emperor, the emperor walks down the street naked, but all the people say, oh, beautiful clothes, beautiful clothes, beautiful clothes. Everybody's part of the game. Nobody sees Buddha. Now I continue to see Buddha there. Now, what, what do I do? Do I say, I've got a number of choices. I've got a set of options at this point, multiple choice. I do not see Buddha. <laughs> Still there. <laughs> that one doesn't work too well. What are my other options? I'm crazy. <laughs> I will go to one of you who doesn't see Buddha and you will help convince me that I am not seeing Buddha. Right. And if I don't go, you'll take me. So <laughs> that's also an option. Um, I demand another option. I demand that you see Buddha. <laughs> oh boy, that one's a bad one. That's, a, that's turning over the temples and the ta tables in the temple. The temples and the table. I continue to see Buddha, but I cool it. You don't see Buddha, great. I see Buddha, fine. I don't demand you see Buddha. You, let me see Buddha. I mean, I'm a good guy, I'm not hurting anybody, but I see Buddha. We'll call me uh, eccentric. <laughs> he tends to see Buddha. <laughs> 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 
The English are great at that. They really, they have a whole category of people in England called eccentrics. And they're really far out people. I mean, they live in all kinds of realms. <laughs> so now here I am, I'm seeing Buddha and uh, you are not. And Buddha's a really far out guy. He's all luminous and light comes out of him and he knows how it all is. Did you ever have a friend like that? He's all luminous and he knows how it all is. I mean, it's really a groovy friend to have. See? Make a friend of Jesus, the song says. But if you try doing it, <laughs> it's another matter. Who do you hang out with? I hang out with Jesus. <coughs> Well, you don't, you mean, you don't mean that literally. Yes, I mean it literally. Doesn't the song say, make a friend of Jesus? Yes, but it doesn't. Oh. <laughs> See, I've cooled it a great deal because the fact of the matter is, and this is as straight as I can say it, that much of the time I hang out with Maharaji. I hang out with my guru. And I talk to him and I, I feel the presence and I feel messages coming from him and I feel his presence. And there's no doubt in my mind that he's there. But I just generally don't go around saying this. Because when you resonate it against other people's consciousness comes back, watch it, watch it, watch it. Very interesting, very interesting. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Rather peculiar, don't you? <laughs> He's only giving us a metaphor. <laughs> Seems like a rational guy. And I'm suggesting to you that the reason you can't hang out with some of these other guys, these luminous beings, is because you don't accept the possibility that anything else could exist other than what you were told exists. Sometimes it's called, it, it, the, the rigidity of thought is sometimes, it's sometimes called functional fixedness. Do you ever have like, a, you got a hammer sitting in the room and you've been hammering nails and there's a hammer and what you really at this point need is a weight to put at the bottom of a string to use as a pendulum and you look all around the room and you decide there is none in the room. And so you don't have something to put on the bottom of the pendulum because you couldn't break your set of seeing the hammer as something to hammer nails with to realize the hammer is something you could tie at the end of the string and use as the pendulum. Wait. Blake called it. And mind forged manacles. Mind forged manacles. Manacles. Mm. Mind forged manacles. Now, the difference is that I <clears throat> am not saying to anybody else what they should see. I'm only saying that there are experiential, there are devices that each human being can go through whereby they are able to even momentarily extricate themselves from a fixed way of seeing it to see, to entertain experientially within them other possibilities. And then they can decide whether all these possibilities are hoax or not. <coughs> How can another person decide my experience is a hallucination or phony? Because they say, because I don't see it and I see reality. I don't see it and I see reality. See, what, the reason wars are fought is because two guys have two different realities.
believe me that the um, the North Chinese, the North Vietnamese, and the Chinese don't sit around saying, "Ah, we're bad guys." <laughs> And we don't sit around saying we're dirty Western imperialists. See, traditions are very strong. Perceptual traditions are very strong. If you've always seen it a certain way and your parents have always seen it a certain way, it's very hard for you to conceive that it might not be that way. It might not be that way. And when you experience that it isn't quite that way, what you tend to do is to reject that experience first, if you possibly can, because it isn't consistent with what you've always been taught. I was very ready after my first experiences of other states of consciousness to reject them. Every time somebody said to me, you did nothing but hallucinate, I said, that's right, that must have been it. I did nothing but hallucinate. See, there's an interesting thing that the Bible talks about because it talks continually about the lest ye see miracles you will not believe. Remember the disciple that had to stick his finger literally into the wound in Christ's side before he would accept the fact that Christ was resurrected. Before he'd believe. And the fact of the matter is that people who only believe because of miracles, their belief is not enough because they're overriding a resistance in them to belief. And even Paul, who was certainly a very, very high being, went in and out of being that highest being. He wasn't finished yet. He wasn't a fully realized being. He wasn't Jesus. Some of the things Paul said in some of his letters were very uh, hang up -y institutional type statements. And some of them were statements of pure light. He was very erratic. Because the way Paul got his belief was because he was right in the middle of his horseback ride. He was struck, you know. I mean, he was told in no uncertain terms how it was. See, and many people say to me, I don't understand what you're doing. And I say, there's nothing I can say to you, really. But I can give you a method whereby you can yourself experience something which will allow you to understand what it is I am doing. That's all I can do for you. It's like try to explain to somebody what it is like to eat a raw oyster. Well, it's certainly the easiest thing to do is get a raw oyster and tell them to open their mouth and stick it in. Or, tell, or explain to somebody how strawberry ice cream is different from chocolate ice cream. See, science can only indirectly be concerned with these issues because it can't deal with direct experience. It can only deal with reports of experience. If I taste strawberry ice creamness, my experience of tasting strawberry ice creamness can never be science because it's a personal experience. And 
scientific data must be public knowledge. Therefore, I can say, I can fill out a questionnaire and say the strawberry ice cream tasted cold, warm, cold. It tasted uh, sweet, sour, sweet. And then we'll get a hundred of people and they'll all say it was cold and sweet and then we'll say, that's science now. Science says, aha, they report coldness and sweetness. Does all those la labels on that questionnaire have anything to do with the experience of strawberry ice creamness? Well, believe me, they don't add up to the same thing, and you all know that. <laughs> In the same way that all of the words any visionary has ever said about his vision don't have anything whatsoever to do with the vision. They're sort of like, well, they don't, it's not to say they don't have anything to do, but they're trivial. They're trivial words. And whole religions have been built on that trivia. That's the problem. Whole religious systems have been built on that kind of trivia. We are talking specifically about the concept of faith. It turns out today. <laughs> Though I certainly hadn't planned to. See, you may have just enough faith to see Buddha when you're alone, but when somebody else is around who doesn't see Buddha, you can't see Buddha. You just can't see Buddha when somebody else is around who's not seeing Buddha. And that's why Ramakrishna says, That when you start your spiritual work, you are like a very tender tree that must be surrounded by a fence because otherwise all the animals will come along and they'll step on it. And later on, when the tree gets very big and strong, everybody can lean on it and get shade from it. Or it's like trying to cross the ocean of existence with a, on a, um, on a uh, leaf or on a bamboo shoot. If your bark is very delicate, you really can't take many people across on it or everybody goes under. If you just cool it for a while and wait, it may get so that everybody can go across on it. <coughs> So at the same moment, when you have seen the light, for example, you have a desire to share the light with the people you love. I mean, that's a very uh, powerful, uh, gregarious force in nature. And the fact is that you can't do it at a certain point because you don't have enough light yet. You don't have enough awareness. You don't have enough faith in the reality that you are seeing, which is slightly different from the reality that you were in before, to be able to share it with somebody who has the old reality because the strength of their commitment to what they know and your lack of strength in your new commitment is just enough so that you'll keep going under all the time. See, that's why my five months when I couldn't read the New York Times and I couldn't read Time magazine and I couldn't, I didn't, I was sitting in a temple with all kinds of other Meshuggah people, all of whom were seeing Buddha there. The result was that I could build a, an acceptance of this other awareness to the point that when I came back into an environment out of which my traditions had, in which others were trained in my traditions, and they said, he isn't there. I could feel compassion and say, gee, I feel terribly sorry that you can't see him there. And I love you very much.
was interesting. When I was thrown out of Harvard, one of the comments that was made the year after in, in a press interview, one of the reporters said to me, you know, you're amazingly undefensive for somebody who's been through what you've been through and been maligned and told you're wrong and all. Now, there was not, it was a very delicate matter because if I said what I thought, I'd say, well, that's okay because I'm right. <laughs> but you know how they would interpret that. I couldn't say that. So I said, yeah, well, hmm, that's interesting. See, a young person has an experience which puts him in a slightly different perceptual vantage point than his parents. And his parents say, you are wrong, and they can get the kid to say, I am wrong, but there is something in the kid that knows that he isn't wrong. And they don't have to beat him to say, because he is so interrelated to their value system that he is willing to buy back and say, I must have been wrong. But yet, that, that experience was a direct experience, and he can't reject it. And he's caught in this terrible bind where he's now in a dishonest condition with himself. And in order to stay in harmony with his parents, he must reject his own direct experience. <laughs> but it takes a great deal of faith to be so rooted in a new system that you can meet somebody in the system you just came out of, honor them, respect them, allow them to stay in their system, not feel the necessity to convert them, honor them, and find that place which is behind their system and your system where we are. It takes a kind of commitment and faith that stands up in spite of. It's like the mumbling in the church, but it's still round, it still goes round. When he is forced to recant, but it still goes round. Couldn't reject. Couldn't reject his direct understanding of how it was. See, when, it's like going to school and you come home and I used to come home and my mother would say to me, how did the teacher say you're doing at school? That's a different question from what are you learning, which is a different question about do you feel you're learning anything? I grew up in a culture where you knew yourself in, on the basis of how others thought about you. First your parents, then your teachers, then your colleagues, then your administrators. And so when the first inner voice comes that says, like, this is the way it is, if it's at odds with all those others, the rest of that, those attitudes around you, the tendency is the tendency is to get pretty uptight because in general you've rejected that but it comes through with a certain kind of validity. The thing is that the history of people who have had direct mystical experiences or direct spiritual experiences is no matter how hard they try they can't refute them. They can't refute them. And so what then starts to happen is that the person has got to develop a set of attitudes to allow him to maintain that inner belief system, that new, new belief. 
See, I'm a Western scientist, and then suddenly I have an experience in which suddenly I believe in God, but Western scientists don't believe in God. Now we got an interesting question. What do I do? At first, I try very hard to hold on to being a Western scientist because that's my bread and butter. That's my gig in society. That's what gets me all of the brownie badges. And it gets harder and harder and harder, and the strain gets more and more intense. And finally, it just gets unbearable. And, and I got to go one way or the other. But I don't have any choice. What choice do I have? Am I going to say, well, then I guess I'm a scientist and all that was wrong? How do you do that? How would you even know where to step next <laughs> if you reject your own experience, your own direct experience? I mean, that's like, um, um, You get into the car and you drive down the street and you meet another car coming over the hill and you stop and somebody says to you, there's no car there, drive on. <laughs> how, would you, how would you do it? How would you know whether the next car you met was a real car or not? The minute you reject your own experience, all you can say at that point is, look, I see a car, I guess I better not drive because I'm seeing cars, I'm seeing pink elephants. Finally, what is required Finally, what is required is that you you take the injunction given so beautifully in Shakespeare to thine own self be true, then canst thou be false to no man. You've got to find a way to live it out being totally in harmony with your inner experiences. Because you're building your house upon sand the minute you reject your inner experiences because they're too dangerous and too scary. You become what Dave Reisman calls other directed. And it's not enough. But you see, the way you learn the original model of the universe was with a certain amount of emotional tone such that you felt that if you lived outside of it, the whole thing would crumble and it would all be horrible. That was the way in which it was taught. That was the leverage that was used, whether it's called eternal damnation or it's called you're going to suffer poverty. It's do like your mother says, otherwise it'll be ugly. All the way along, do like your mother says, otherwise it'll be ugly. Do like your father says, he knows best. So there is a lot of anxiety to the experience of having an inner experience that is disparate from the existing cultural perception of the universe. 
it's really pretty scary. It's really pretty scary. And many of us have wished many times that it hadn't happened. Why can't I be like everybody else? Why did it have to happen to me? But the game is such that it's irreversible and irrevocable. And you should have thought of that before. <laughs> and once the seed is planted, it's too late. And the fact is, you had no choice, really. The seed was planted because you were ready to have the seed planted. But it's going to take you a long time to go from the place where you felt horror that you are now in a disparate position to the culture to feeling compassion for the culture because it's stuck in a place where you are not. <laughs> That's a far out one. You really got to be crazy for that one. To say everybody is wrong and I am right and believe it. To say it bluffly, that's one thing, you know. You're all wrong and I'm right. <laughs> yeah. It's different, but to just know that that's the way it is, quietly and calmly, and live with that. Live with that. What can you do? What is there to do? What is there to do about it? Let's say you find yourself in this predicament. What is there to do about it? You can't convince anybody because it can't be, it can't be said through words. It can only happen through experience because everybody else is in the same predicament you are. They all have that strong attachment too. Well, at first, everybody gets very grandiose with their plans of how to do it. Why don't we put LSD in the water supply? They say. Of course, that's not going to work. That's just going to scare everybody. I won't plant the seed. Just plant fear and terror. That's like turning over the tables of the temple. Can't do that. You can't do it. Nothing you can do. You're in this absurd predicament. It's just like the Philadelphia Inquirer ad in the New Yorker. There's nothing you can do about it. The train is bearing down and everybody's reading the paper and they're so fascinated with the paper and you're screaming, look out for the train and nobody's listening to you and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. So what do you do? You work on yourself. You center more and more. You get calmer. You build on that little light inside, you keep building your system. And after you get over the horror and the awe of being in this disparate position to everyone else, you find out that there are ways of getting across that interface. There are ways of making contact such that the difference isn't as important as you thought it was. And that you and I, even though I see Buddha and you don't, we can still be buddies. We just don't have to talk about Buddha. We don't have to talk about Buddha. He 
because then you find out that all of your symbols just get in the way and that there is a way of making contact behind the way you see reality and the behind the way I see reality. And we can find a place where we can both be together where it's all all right. But in order for that to happen, I have got to be able to give up my attachment to my new symbol. And I'm asking the same thing of myself as I was asking of somebody else. In other words, finally, I can only say to another human being, here we are right now, here and now in the present. And there's no your model and there's no my model and there's no need to understand how it all is and how to and to agree or di disagree or agree to disagree or anything. Forget all that. Here we are. What should we do? What, should, what is there? What is it? What is needed? What is this at this moment? Well, we're hungry. Who's going to cook? Now, if I say, well, God will take care of everything. I've just lost him. <laughs> what I'm saying is that there are many people in a social system at any time that are living in different stratas of reality, different degrees of consciousness. And it is possible to jump these interfaces between these levels of consciousness and it is always the responsibility of the most conscious being to do it. Let's see, what did he say, Paul Twitchell? The higher one climbs on the spiritual ladder, the more he will grant others their own freedom and give less interference to another's state of consciousness. The more I'm conscious, this is the less I got to come on to you about how I believe. It all is. Because with higher consciousness comes compassion. And compassion is the understanding of why everybody is at the place they're at. Did you ever be around somebody who has a little boy with them and the little boy can't do exactly what an adult do and the adult keeps saying to them, uh, come on, step aside, you can't do it. At constant, you're just a little boy, you can't do it. But not even you're a little boy, like you're some incompetent being because you're not big. Compassion is a true empathy, a true understanding of why each person is in the predicament they're in and exactly where they're at at that moment. It's, it's more than empathy. It's a total identity with the other person. You see, we are, this is who we are. I am Richard Nixon in the White House. I am caught in my dilemma of my history as a Quaker and my background and my values and my attitudes and my attachments and my responsibilities and my problems. And I am as much Richard Nixon as I am Ram Dass. And when you have met somebody with compassion, you know you have met somebody who appreciates the predicament you're in, even though they may or may not agree with your predicament. They understand how it all is. They see the situation you're in. And how does that compassion develop? The compassion only develops as a result of non-attachment. That's the only way it can happen. You can't be compassionate in an ego sense. Look what a compassionate guy I am. Can't do it that way. It doesn't work. Compassion only happens when you're not attached. If I'm so busy seeing it the way I got to see it, I can't see it the way you see it. But the minute I say, yeah, I see it this way, that's right. Now. That's that way. 
In other words, the minute I treat myself as another one of the systems, rather than as the system, I mean, there are all your ways and there's my way and my way is right. How about there are all these ways, including my way, and they're all wrong and they're all right. And they're all not enough because any system is never enough. I mean, at the moment, I can see here, I can't see what he sees looking through the eye of that camera. Unless I'm so unattached to me and being here that I can literally be inside him seeing through the eye of the camera. And that's exactly what a yogic power called Samyama is about. That is the capacity to leave any time space locus and be in other places and see how it is from that place literally, not figuratively, not theoretically, but actually. But that kind of takes a degree of non-attachment that's pretty, pretty much, pretty much. We can share it. You can't have pompous compassion. You can't have egoic compassion. You can't have look how that I'm being. I'm a very compassionate person. Compassionate people never say I'm a very compassionate person. They're just compassionate people. It's like realized beings don't go around saying I'm a realized being. I'm a very high being. Had you noticed? And they're not just making believe they're not saying it. They just never think about those things because that isn't where their head is at. They're not busy in self-definition. Once the seed is planted, a person is faced with the predicament of knowing something is true, being surrounded by many people who don't, who don't see it the way you see it, and realizing that for anything really to happen, you have to see that your way of seeing it is as much illusion as their way of seeing it is, and accept it all as illusion, and then communication can be made. But as long as I say, look, it's black, and you say it's white, and I say it's black, and you say it's white, here we are. We're always going to be stuck on these two sides. But if I say, some say it's white, and some say it's black, and here we are. Now we've just gone right behind that place. It's always possible with every human being. And it's always the responsibility of the most conscious person to extricate himself from his own attachments. And that's why to make contact with another human being, the, the, the rule is always work on yourself. If I want to get close to you, go into my own center. That's the rule. If I center enough and go behind my own attachments, here you'll be. And once you develop compassion, then you keep going. Then there are many more levels before you are free of the illusion. Compassion is just another illusion. But you've got to go a step at a time. You've got to get up to the doorway before you can go through it. There's no sense in trying to clump through the doorway when you're not anywhere near it. Somebody, like, push open the door, and there the door's about 40 feet away. Westerners in their intellectual zeal to get there always intellectually get ahead of where they're at. (laughs) 
we are one and one is joy and joy is pain and pain is real and real are you and you are me and that is all there is to be. We are time and time is wise and wise is beauty and beauty is love and love is you and you are me and that is all there is to be. A hand in hand, a rainy day, a grain of sand, a child at play, dogs and moons and milk and sun, worldly all is only one. We are God and God is truth and truth is light and light is life and life is you, and you are me, and that is all there is to be. <clears throat> Rah, rah, rah.